at this time, I'll entertain any questions for the group. So this question is actually more for the whole panel. Um, we've seen a lot of, you know, talking about rules and regulations and changing those. What justification would you see for opening the statute, for opening up the Practice Act, instead of just doing regs and rules? I'll, I'll start and we can pass it on down. <clears throat> First, um, remember that you have no control over your Practice Act. Just because you choose not to open it doesn't mean that somebody else can't open it. So that, that's a common fallacy that, that if, if you don't open your Practice Act, it stays closed. No, not necessarily. But I would say the main justification would be if, if your Practice Act is limiting the ability of your people to practice in a safe, effective, and efficient manner. And a lot of the older practice acts, especially if they, uh, they were into laundry listing, um, Nebraska's first draft of a practice act listed modalities. Well, <laughs> you know, we'd have been back revising that every year if that had, had ever stood. So if your practice act has, has a, a, a limitation on the way that you can practice safely and efficiency, I would say that would be the overriding issue you would want to go back to. I agree with what Dave said, but the other thing is also, and maybe it's you know our perspective as regulators versus you know licensees themselves. I don't necessarily think that boards need to be as afraid of opening their practice act as think as a lot of people always you know. And I, I deal with three different professions, all three, and even when I was at the nursing boards, always oh we can't open the practice act. At the end of the day, what Dave said is correct. Anyone can open your practice act. But two, if you are the ones that are trying to open your own practice act, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to find a legislative sponsor that you can trust. And if somebody else is going to try to amend the bill in a way that you don't agree with, theoretically, you're going to have that sponsor pull the bill. And a good sponsor is going to say, because I have the relationship with the AT Association, they don't agree with this amendment that got accepted, they would rather kill the whole bill than have the bill pass with something they don't like. A good sponsor is going to kill the bill. So ultimately, you don't have to be as fearful as opening your practice. Now, I would say, if you can address things through the rulemaking process, that's a whole lot easier because the board controls the rulemaking process. Changing the statute, you know, it's you have to go through that whole legislative process. But I mean, so if you can do it through rules, always do it through rules. Um, but I don't think licensees and associations need to be as fearful about opening their Practice Act when the Practice Act needs to be modernized. I mean, it's, it's, we've got a lot of, especially in athletic training, a lot of Practice Acts that probably are not modernized enough to reflect the current state of AT practice that do need to be opened up. Because the only way in the states where AT practice is limited by who you can serve, not by what you do, you can't solve that through rules. That has to be solved through opening up the Practice Act and changing the statute. Changing you know, the practice settings away from just the traditional practice setting. That can't be addressed through the rulemaking process. That has to be done through modernizing your Practice Act. It may not be successful the first few times you try to get that change, but ultimately, it's don't have to worry about we're just going to be limited in what we can do as athletic trainers in our state because we don't want to potentially make a change that's needed because of what the PTs, what the chiropractors, what the physicians, what somebody else is going to do to our law. If they wanted to do something to your law, they don't have to ask you before they're going to do it. I, I would agree with both. Um, Florida recently got some language change within the law that I'm sorry they had to do it since I was responsible for the first one. But the difference was we were writing that at the time in the early to mid-90s that was fighting a political environment that I had no bloody choice. Um, I, I had no choice. <laughs> I had to put in language that would get enough support to let us go forward. We always knew in the future we would have to come back and revisit it. There were times because of political environment at that time we did not want to reopen it. However, now was the time that was ripe for it. Why? Hundreds of reasons. The profession had grown and become more accepted. Other people had backed off their hardcore stances. More of the legislators had kids coming through playing sports. 
to be quite frankly honest with you. And we're even being seen by them in clinical situations. So because of that, it enhanced its ability to go through. It had the support of a couple other departments within the state. It was time to do at least that part of it. So opening it up, he's right. Anybody can come along and open up yours. It's going to happen somehow, some way, probably. So don't be afraid of it. And it is so much easier to kill a bill than to get one passed because I threatened the PTs at the time we were getting ours voted on to kill two of their bills, and that's why we got it voted on. I would agree that you do need to take a good hard look at your political climate. You know, what does it look like? If, uh, if your practice act is tying the hands of your athletic trainers, it should be opened. And I, and I do, I joke about, I mean, you're there for, for everybody and you do become somewhat vulnerable. A good bill sponsor can kill that, but kill the bill if that's going to happen to you. But then you kind of expose your game plan to everybody at the same time. Um, so if you can go general, uh, get as general as you possibly can. As far as anybody can open it up, I would say look at your laws. In Utah, they passed a law that said if somebody wants to get into your practice act, they have to notify the profession. They have to give you advance notice. It, they have to prove why they want to open it and that it's in the best interest of the public and it has to go before a committee. And you can go defend why you don't want them to open or why this is not necessary. So I would say check your states and see if there's some hidden law back there that, that doesn't allow them to just open your practice act without giving you behind the scenes, you know, ground to stand on to try to prevent it if in fact that is not what you want. So I, I know that in Utah we do have that one. It's fairly new. I don't know if it's exclusive to Utah, but I would say it's worth that it's definitely worth looking into. How do we better inform members that when they come to a state that they have to be licensed in the state to practice or a recent grad gets really excited that they pass the BOC exam but yet they haven't graduated, they don't have their certification number which therefore means that they can't get their license which means that they can't practice. Um, I run across this all the time and my favorite is when applicants say to me, well I applied for license well, just because you applied doesn't mean that you can practice, or I'm licensed in this state, so I should have no problem, and since I'm chair of the licensing board, I delicately tell them that it's about an eight-week process, especially if it's in June or July when you're dealing with other medical professions, and I, it seems like I'm the only one that's telling these recent applicants this, because then they're saying, wow, you're the 10th person that I've talked to about employment, and nobody's told me this yet. That's one of my pet peeves. We have, in my opinion, as people, an obligation to be responsible for our own daggum actions. They found out when they were 15 what it was going to take to get their driver's license. Then I think it's incumbent upon them to do the research and find out about it. Now, as program and educators leading these programs, we need to help a little bit but that only comes from the standpoint of pointing them in the direction. They still need to take the onus to go find out the information, figure it out, and get it done. Again, my pet peeve is when they were 15 or 14, they started looking towards that driver's license. By God, they had that figured out when it came that year before that birthday. They knew what they had to do. There's no difference in my mind. So don't feel bad. And, and every time it is, when somebody looked at me even early on in those days back in the 90s and said, well, what are you going to do about it? I looked at him and said, well, what are you going to do about it? It's your responsibility as a professional to do it. Amen. And that's where I leave it. <laughs> Sorry, that was my soapbox. I, I guess I have a question. Shannon, when they receive their BOC card, they've passed, and they, congratulations, you passed. Do they get any little notice saying, hey, make sure whatever state you're going to practice in, make sure you consult their laws to see what's required? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Done. 
No, they even when they pass the exam and they're not yet certified, if their file's not complete, we explicitly tell them in the notification that they are not allowed to use ATC yet because they are not yet certified. Once they are certified, we actually have a series of emails that goes to the newly certified people. The very first one says you need to get a license to practice. So they are being told by us. And to take your analogy just one step further, if you drive without a license and you get pulled over by a police officer, you get a ticket and you probably get a trip to jail. If you practice without a license, there should be a hefty penalty. And it doesn't take but one time of getting that reinforced and people will talk. And to address that, the hefty penalty is often, the board's gonna discipline your license. And as I, whenever I talk to students, it's when you get disciplined by the board, that is something that stays with you for your entire career. That's reported to the National Practitioner's Data Bank. We post it on our website. When we verify your license to another state, it'll say that your Ohio license was disciplined. So it's not you know, just a simple mistake that just goes away. It will stay with you for the entire time you are practicing as an athletic trainer. I may not be a veteran, so to speak, yet. Um, I'm getting there. Veteran in healthcare. But um, when I came out of my program for athletic training, they drop kicked you into the field and said, go get licensed now. And as soon as you're licensed, get your insurance, get your, get your um, liability insurance and carry it with you. I don't care what your school carries for you, you carry your own. And um, it, was, it was important and those were things that we were instilled in us. And um, I see students come out of, of programs now, and, and I'm a clinical preceptor now, and that is one of the things that, that they come out of my preceptor site with, is that know your practice act, and I'm, I make them pull, pull it. I, I don't give it to them. I make them pull it, and I make them read it, and I make them come back to me with the information, with specific information. I make them go and find it, because those are things that are important know what you have to do to get your licensure. And if you don't know how, and you're absolutely right, they, there are many, many emails that come back that tell you what to do to get it. And I'm from Georgia, by the way, originally, in Colorado now, but. Well, it, th this gray hair started in the mid 90s when it took over that stuff in Florida and it got worse. So that's, that's my story and I'm sticking to it on that one. Let's hark back to an earlier presentation. We talked about the physical or the organizational location of the educational programs within the university settings. Are they a, a, an offshoot of the kinesiology physical activity or are they nested in with the culture of a health professional educational group? And there's another advantage to being part of that health professional education is that licensure is a very real, a very common issue within all of the health professions. So it's worked more into the curriculum as you go through. It's worked more into the culture of the, the educational programs itself. Whereas if the program is freestanding or associated with other areas, sometimes that aspect can get overlooked. Thank you guys for your presentation. I greatly appreciate it. You each gave some uh, discussion on the political climate of the time. Uh, it, it may seem easier to read when it's a good thing to open the act, and there may be some nuances when it wouldn't be. Would you lead on to some uh, nuances when, in the political climate, some things that people wouldn't usually look for when it's not time to open, open the act? My experience has been you've got to pay close attention to the subtle overtones of the party in control of government in the state and who sits in the governor's mansion. At the same time, your lobbyists better be on their toes for figuring out what is that underlying current as well. There's a lot of things that don't hit the newspaper that are discussed behind those doors in the hallways outside of committee meetings that are discussed when the legislators get together after they've talked to the lobbyists and have a lunch and a cocktail. That's where that lobbyist comes in. I can't tell you when those are, but that's your best way to go find out. And just as well, there can oftentimes be subtle undercurrents 
of when it's a really good time that you may not be aware of. So the moral of my story is that you better have somebody that's in the know, talk to your regulator. They know what's coming out of the governor's office as far as opinions on things. They have a good idea what's coming down the pipe already, as well as your lobbyists. And that's the best recommendation I can give you for both ways. I would say if your arch nemesis legislator becomes the Speaker of the House, <laughs> that might not be a good time. <laughs> Until your allies become the Chair of Rules, the Chair of Health and Human Services, and call in all their political favors and then go directly to them and say, promise me that you won't shuffle the board and sneak something in. And then, if that does happen to you, start it on the other side. Start it in the Senate so that they can't go behind your back and do something to it in the other, on the other side. I think this goes back to the great commandment, thou shalt not regulate in a vacuum. You have to be plugged in with the, the political currents of your state, territory, province, or jurisdiction. Uh, you have to know what's happening in other professions. You have to know what's happening with the, the political situation. If you are trying to simply sit in an isolated office and talk to no one but athletic trainers, there's never a good time to open your practice act because you will be clobbered every time it happens. Uh, remember that there are two golden opportunities for thinking about opening a practice act, though, and you, you can then take the negative or the, the obverse of those. The first is when you have a change in the governor's office because at that point, everything kind of goes by the wayside. Uh, policies can change, people will change, or institutional memory will be short-circuited to some degree, so there's always an opportunity there for getting some kind of change on the table. And the second one is whenever you have that similar kind of, of overturn or change in the legislature. Uh, be particularly aware of who have been, which senators or legislators have been your particular allies or opponents over the years, and pay attention to their political fate, because that will give you a good clue as to when it's time to go in and maybe, maybe make an overture. And, and really, just, just one last thing on that is, I get, I get back to the once you get in, you really don't get out, because you'll have the history and so somebody who's brand new coming in doesn't have the history. They don't know the fights that you've been through and if you've tried this before or, you know, made some kind of a backroom deal about something, one thing or another. So, so once you get in, you really, you really need to be tied into it for the long haul, even if you're just there as a reference. I appreciate, uh, Tim, when you talk about don't, uh, don't make a rule for something that there's already a rule there for. Uh, an example within our university, I don't make a program rule if there's already a university rule in place. My question to you in writing the rules and regs, who could you identify as a resource because I don't know what I don't know about other laws within that type of thing. Who do we, is there specific resources that we can reach out to to help delineate those rules, those type of things? The one person that was my best friend during that whole time was the lady from the AG's office, Kathy Lannon, and I still hold her on a pedestal to this day. Whether it's the person from the AG or the judge advocate, whichever way it works in your state, that is your best person. They can tell you in an instant. If not, they'll get it back to you in 30 minutes as to whether or not it's necessary. They're going to know and help direct you a lot of time telling you which ones you do need to write. And if you start down that path of one that may be redundant, they're going to tell you that ahead of time. Because the fewer times you encounter a redundancy in writing your rules and regs, the quicker the final approval process will be done. Whether it's another, in, in, in Florida, for instance, for all those years, the AG helped us. Then it went before a JAPSI, which is a judge advocate panel that had to finish clarifying and approving. And it would be publicly noticed before that and during that process. 
once it hit Japsy, if we kept putting up things that were redundant and Japsy kept going, well, why are you doing this? It's already there. They're going to tie us up or, t or turn down others that we were writing. That person from the AG or even the Japsy or the judge advocate, however it is in your state, and find that out. That's what you've got to be sure of, first of all. That person is your best friend during that process. There's no other way to say it. Um, it, it that's who it is. Because I, out of curiosity, anybody in here hold a JD degree? Dolly, shut up. Okay, but it, am I wrong on that? None of us other than Tom are in here with a Juris Doctorate. We're not attorneys. And even within that, there's areas of specialization, specialization that have to do with regulatory and constitutional law. Those are the people who sit in those positions that help you out. But because you're a board doing a public function, it should be somebody internally in the state so you're not really totally billed for that thing. And that's who it is. Florida worked in such a way that the AG was appointed to that board, especially in its infancy. It was just for that purpose. And I was not kidding. At that point in time, she literally sat on my right-hand side at every meeting to either elbow me or smack me for something I was getting ready to have us do. And she would clarify language and say to us, you guys are too onerous on that disciplinary matter. You're writing something that's stupid the way it sounds. And it's probably on a tape somewhere because of Florida Sunshine Laws, and she told me that numerous times. I'm just saying, I mean, that is your best asset now. There's no other way to say it. I, I would say, think of the question, who writes the laws in your state? In Utah, we have um, what's called legislative research. You have the idea, you go to ledge research, ledge research says you need to, you don't need to, here's what it's going to refer back to and whatever else. So who actually writes your laws? If you have a ledge research, that might be a good place to begin. Once again, I want to thank the panel for their time. And um, at this time, um, lunch is available, compliments of the BOC. It's in the Winnebago Flanagan room. That's right down the hall. Um, we would hope that you would take this opportunity to network with other participants. We will meet back in this room at 1 o'clock.